what you're looking at. It's time for Ask the Pastor. We've had a lot of excellent questions. We won't be able to get to quite all of them today. But the bulk of questions and comments have been a flurry in response to the previous video, Heaven Ain't My Home, in which we talked about the distinction of heaven as being the place you go when you die to rest with Jesus until the last day, and the heaven which is the paradise of the new heavens and the new earth, which Jesus will bring with him on that last day, and into which he will resurrect you and your body, so you can live, breathe, and eat, dance, world without end. Amen. Well, Ellie asks, what are the implications of millennialism on what you just said? It bothers me that some will imagine that Jesus will come back to earth, restore perfect creation, only for humans to screw it up again a thousand years later. Amen to that, and this is a real can of worms you're asking about. The Lutheran confessions are pretty clear on this one too, by the way. And even though there are a few venerable ancient fathers who held to that systematic theology of millennialism, it's most rightly attributed to being a rabbinic myth, a myth from the rabbis, than with the real, actual, biblical Christianity. And your point is well taken, that Jesus would have to be a pretty terrible king if after a thousand years of his perfect and almighty reign, the whole thing devolves into rebellion and chaos. Especially since, like, around year 998 or 999, he ought to be, you know, maybe trying to stop it or something. But let's define our terms. Definition. Millennialism. It's a once minor, but now in the USA, major alternative to orthodox biblical theology. And it teaches that the 1,000 year reign of Christ, which is revealed in St. John's Apocalypse, will happen here on this planet with a capital city and armed guards and limousines and flags, a giant global country with Jesus as king on a throne in Jerusalem. Now people approach this theology of this kingdom on earth from different directions, but integral to the whole thing is reading Revelation chapter 20 apart from its context, and then in some ways using it as a key to understanding most of the rest of the Bible. Now this whole thing is even more muddled when you bring into the picture dispensational millennialism, which is purely a late western phenomenon phenomenon popularized among radical Protestants, but which now has become really mainstream mainline evangelicalism. But here's the long and short of the problem. If you really want to hold to a literal 1,000 year reign of Jesus on this planet, then you also need to face the hard reality that, according to John, there's only a literal 144,000 people total redeemed from the earth. Throw into this, you got to understand then that the seven letters written to the seven literal churches in Revelation are for them and them alone. No application to you. And on top of that, you preachers of this stuff might want to stop claiming that those psycho demon locust beasts in chapter 9 are Apache helicopters and that the ancient pagan land of Rosh is modern Russia. You can't have it both ways. Is it literal? Then read it literally. Now to be fair, not all millennialists in history hold to this bizarre and Christ crucified to the side system, but most of the ones in America do. For my part, the unfairly labeled ah millennial view tends to make a lot more sense of sola scriptura, scripture alone in its context. So that 10 times 10 times 10, which is a thousand, or, or 10 multiplied three times, is the number of completion, 10, occurring with the number of God, three. So you have completion times completion times completion, or a triune completion of years, which will exist when Christ reigns on his throne, you know, at the right hand of God the Father Almighty until he comes again to judge the living and the dead. A triune complete era happening right now until he returns to take us home. What? You still want to read the Bible literally? Then you're going to have to tell Jesus that he really messed up back in chapter 1 when he started talking about those stars and those lampstands as if they symbolized congregations and their pastors. Silly Jesus. So this is my body, this is my blood is symbolic, but psycho demon locust beasts are literally helicopters. Now Matt wants me to unpack, in light of Brian McLaren's interview on Issues Etc., what the Kingdom of God means. I haven't yet listened to the Big Mix interview, and I'm not sure if I want to. But my guess is that from his point of view, the Kingdom of God has something to do with you. Am I right? Oh, 
He said, us? That's right, emergent community. So it's about me and you. Oh, that's so much better for my conscience. Jeez. The key to dealing with Kingdom of God talk in the Bible is first and foremost to let the Bible do the talking. And that means that you can't just read one or two parables here and then start talking about what you think it means as if that's God's truth. But we have been deceived a little in our English-speaking lands ever since the King James Version first translated the Greek word basiluo as kingdom. Now, here's the issue. In Greek, nouns and verbs work together, just like English does eh, sometimes. So, think about it. What does a runner do? She runs. What does a cook do? He cooks. What does a king do? He kings. No, he reigns. But see, in Greek, that's the same word. So start right here like this. Every time you read the phrase, the kingdom of God in your New Testament, and especially in Matthew, mentally scratch out the word kingdom and put in the word reign. Because a kingdom is not first and foremost a place. Not really. A kingdom is a realm in which the king kings. So when Jesus shows up and starts saying all this gnarly stuff like the reign of God is at hand and the reign of God stands among you and repent and believe the good news of the reign of God. A lot more is going on than him just encouraging some ancient postmodern neo-Marxist squishy Christians to imagine there's a world with no heaven and no hell. He's saying that God was active in the world right there, right then, right now. Because hey, I, Jesus, am active. Check it out, I'm a catheter demon. Boom. Oh, and what am I really here for? Well, the poor you will always have with you. But I'm going to the cross to die for you, rich and poor alike, and to rise from the dead in order to conquer death for you, rich and poor alike. And I'm going away to leave you with the spirit which is this same active reign of God in, with, and under my office of the holy ministry, that is, under my words and my divine rights, water, bread, wine, which will forgive the sins of you and your children to a thousand generations until I come again to literally restore Eden by the power of my blood. By Job, that's great. Let's get busy building the kingdom of God. See, that's, that's kind of asinine. Just think about it logically. What kind of powerless king has other people build his kingdom for him? You say I am a king? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting. Put that in your pacifist pipe and smoke it. Seriously. And AJ writes, Rev Fisk, I was wondering, any thoughts on technology in the new creation? You made me think of it by comparing it to Rivendell, which is obviously a step backwards from where we are now. Right there, I gotta stop you, AJ. Is it? Can you make a sword that glows whenever orcs are near? I can. He goes on, It seems that we take it for granted that many technologies will be gone, and that we will return to horse and cart. In a first article sense, aren't these technologies like art and music and sport, aren't they part of the creation that God intended us to enjoy, and so part of the the new creation? Yep, absolutely. I mean, I have no clue, really, what it will actually be like. It's science. Real science. Not the idolatry of reason and materialism we call science today. Science, speculative inquiry, study of the first article, use of it for the sake of good, is a child of Christianity. Now, it's not a direct line, but you drive a combustion engine because of the impact that a Christian worldview has had on civilization. Now, personally, I kind of hope it's going to be much better than a combustion engine. Like, I don't know, somehow more organic. I'd rather not have to kill trees. But then again, I was raised on the propaganda of Captain Planet and the Planeteers, so I obviously am going to have a green bias in my blood a little bit. But check it out. New heavens with eternity to steward it. You're telling me that we can go to the moon when it's a dusty rock, but in the the paradise of life eternal we won't be able to explore? I mean, maybe then the moon really will be made of cheese, like a fine mahone, and that those whose vocation here has been miner, who loved mining, will there mine fine cheese on the moon, since there won't be any fossil fuels, since there wouldn't have been a worldwide flood to punish sin. Oops, did I tip my creationist hat? AJ has one more question. He says, my real concern, of course, is my Xbox 360. Can I at least play Madden? Now, I think a pickup game with Madden himself, or the Paradise equivalent, right after a Eucharistic dinner, with a pint or two of New Jerusalem golden wheat Trappist warming the soul, will beat to old creation, sitting in a dark room even with high definition pixelation. The chief thing to keep in mind when we get into Paradise Talk is to remember that whatever it actually comes to be as Jesus gives, it will be good and we will be good. So you're going to like it. It can be hard to imagine in our flesh because we still carry the weight of imperfection, but the Spirit of God that already dwells in you through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus imputed via word and sacrament, the promises of his reign active in you now, he will always keep that worldview everlasting something worth looking forward to. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come.
you imagine if Jesus showed up on the last day, raised us all from the dead, and then sat us down and said, now it's going to be a few billion years while I evolve the new creation. Oh, and just ignore all the death and bloodshed that's going on. It won't be there when I get done. It's a pretty hard line in the sand, eh?